So we're going to be talking about the Rose Croix in terms of its French meaning, which literally, and I know some of you do speak French, Rose Croix in English means Rose Cross and refers to or references members of an ancient order that is mystical rather than religious. So for Otters and Sorors, I want you to contemplate a particular question during the presentation because we'll come back to it in the discussion. So at one point, the imperator, former imperator, Imperator Emeritus Christian Bernard, gave a presentation in which he told us to be a rose croix. So I want you to think about that, just exactly what you think that might mean, and we'll come back to it in the discussion. So I'm going to now share my screen with you. So I'm going to click on the presentation so that you can see that. And I know that our, our host will help highlight this. So this is uh, excellent. Thank you so much. And you can see that all right? Okay, just nod. <laughs> so it's entitled, Who are the Rose Claw? This is part one. And I've given it a subtitle, The Search for the Philosopher's Stone. So today we're going to go on a little journey into the past, looking at particular personalities and also applying some of that wisdom to ourselves. In the first image, you will see this beautiful painting called Alchemist in His Laboratory. It's by a Flemish artist who was born just after the publication of the first Rosicrucian Manifesto, the Fama Fraternitatis. So he lived during the time period of the height of alchemy. And you will see certain signs in this image of what looks like a Rosicrucian laboratory or an alchemical laboratory. So for Otters and Sorors, you will notice a lot of books and papers. This reminds me a little bit of my own office before I tidy it up. Especially I want to thank Frater Hugh McKay for his beautiful presentation last Wednesday on cosmic consciousness, because it applies very much so to what we are talking about today. So the question is, who are the Rose Croix? Were they alchemists of old? Poets, artists, physicians? scientists, philosophers, seekers for enlightenment or illumination, members of a mystery school, perhaps of the ancient mystical order Rosicrucius, otherwise known as the Rosicrucians of today. Here are some of the personalities of the past that we're going to look at. Now, I've reduced my slideshow to try to fit it into that uh, approximately 30, 35 minute time frame, and it will conclude with the meditation and then follow with a discussion. So we hopefully will be able to finish within an hour's time. So we're going to start with Benjamin Franklin and go back into the past next to Robert Flood, then to Paracelsus. And we have Isaac Newton a little bit out of place here, but there's a reason and a logic why I placed him where he is in the course of the chronology. And finally, Nicholas Flamel. Many of you have uh, perhaps more recently discovered that Nicholas Flamel has shot to, to fame due to the, the Harry Potter books, and Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. So let us start with Benjamin Franklin as an evolving mystic. He was born in Boston to a poor artisan. His father made candles in 1706. However, despite this, Franklin made his fortune by age 42 and retired as a gentleman so that he could pursue his hobby or his true interest, which was natural philosophy. As a student of natural philosophy, which really was what science and mysticism combined together were called in that time period, could he have found the Philosopher's Stone? Philadelphia, his later home in his later adulthood, is associated with the first Rosicrucians in America and Johannes Kelpius, Conrad Beisel, and the Ephrata community. 
if you look at the year in which Ben Franklin was born, 1706, you will notice that Johannes Calpius was alive at the time of Franklin's birth, passing through transition in 1708. And that Conrad Beisel established the Afrata community just outside of Philadelphia around the time of, uh, again, Ben Franklin. As an evolving mystic open to new ideas, Franklin adjusted his thinking over time on various subjects. And you probably know a little bit about his biography, that is that he was first in favor of the stamp tax and then revised his thinking. Also because he traveled to England around the age of 20 to 22, he took up the, his, uh, he was one of 17 children and he took up the, um, the printing process understanding the printing process and refining his ability with that, but also at the same time while in London, he really became enamored with British society. And his thinking was at the time that it was much more civilized than American society. And he did return to Philadelphia and live there. And you know that he is associated with his humanitarianism, mainly because many of his inventions, including the Franklin stove, bifocal glasses, and I know you know that he experimented in electricity. Later in his life, he won the Copley Medal from the Royal Society in England, and he was one of the few Americans in the 18th century who was made a fellow of the Royal Society in London, and he did return there to live for a few years. You'll notice that he was a self-taught writer, he, because his family was poor and he wasn't the firstborn, he could attend school only until the age of 10. And then he had to be self-taught. He taught himself the writing by reading other fine writers and essays. He would read what he was, what he was given to print. He also was a statesman. And in that regard, I know you know that he drafted American uh, uh, Declaration of Independence. However, before that, when he was younger, he also believed that it was a good thing that the British crown ruled the colonies. But he, as an evolving myth, mystic, was able to revise his thinking. And then he became an ambassador. And that brings me to the next slide. You will see him here in, uh, in an effigy actually in the restaurant, the oldest restaurant in Paris, France. It was the meeting place of philosophers, ambassadors, and French notables. Here it is elevated. That's actually a mirror image, this photograph, and very golden and illuminated by the lighting. He was very popular in France, and he uh, negotiated with the French government to aid the new American Republic. When he was still in England, around the age of 22, and I want you to notice that he made his transition in 1790 at the age of 84, so at the tender age of eight, uh, 22, he wrote his epitaph, and it went like this. The body of B. Franklin printer, like the cover of an old book, its contents torn out and stripped of its lettering and gilding, lies here food for worms. But the work shall not be wholly lost, for it will, as he believed, appear once more in a new and more perfect edition, corrected and amended by the author. Now this brings us to Robert Flood, who lived in the previous century, and his connection to the Rose Croix. Above the coat of arms in the British Museum portrait, you will see in Latin, in your light we will see light. You will also notice the sun with its rays shining down in more Latin. And I've made an attempt to translate what it says. And I think that will probably remind you of uh, Pharaoh of Natan and his worship of the Aten as a symbol for cosmic intelligence. Remember that Agnaton, very important in our tradition and in Egyptian history, was the first mono ruler. 
So in Latin, this is possibly what it says. I'm not as good at, at my Latin as some of you might be, so please do correct me. By your illustrious light in me, Yeshua, God beyond God, by your splendor and brightness, enlighten my darkness. That is a beautiful invocation. He was a student of natural philosophy, Robert Flood. He also lived in England. He was a, a wonderful mathematician. He was an artist, he made many illustrations himself. He was a physician. That's how he first trained as a medical doctor. He was a physicist, an astrologer, a practicing alchemist. He had his own laboratory, a mystic, and a Rosicrucian apologist meaning that he defended Rosicrucianism to those who misunderstood it. He also lived during the time of the publication of the Rosicrucian Manifestos, and we also know that he was a friend of Michael Mayer. Now, this is a very important symbol to us as Rosicrucians because it is Robert Flood's drawing of the Rose Cross with the Latin, Dat Rosa Mel Apulus. The rose gives honey to the bees. So in the great work of alchemy called the magnum opus, the goal was the discovery of the philosopher's stone, the inner gem, the cosmic quintessence, the elixir of life. So what is the philosopher's stone? A clue exists in the symbolism of the rose and the cross. The rose is the greater light or cosmic soul, the cross mundane existence itself. The marriage of both rose and cross creates the opportunity for self-discovery. Many Rosicrucian students are familiar with the phrase ad rosum per crucum and the English translation, and it goes on beyond what some of you may have studied so far, but it goes like this. To the rose by way of the cross, to the cross by way of the rose, in it the rose, in them the rose and the cross, I emerge once more as a precious stone. So now let us take a look at Paracelsus, whose name was Philip Theophrastus Bombast von Hohenheim. And he comes before Robert Flood, but was alive during Robert Flood's lifetime. Now, what is interesting about his name, the word bombast in English, is often thought to be come from Paracelsus, who some say was quite self-proclaiming. But I read elsewhere that it was likely a name given to him by his admirers, and circle of students and used by his publishers. So you will see that in German we have a phrase below, ich habe gefunden, was viele zu ihrem Unglück suchen, dem lapidum philosophorum, and then again in Latin. What that says is, I have found what many search for through their lack of luck, the stone of the philosophers. That is an 18th century depiction of what Paracelsus might have looked like as an alchemist. And you see kind of many of the symbols related to alchemy. However, this is probably a more accurate portrait by Hirschvogel done in 1540. So you'll see also again the dates for Paracelsus. He was an alchemist, of course, but he was also a chemist. And he is known for some of his very important discoveries in chemistry. First of all, we owe him a lot because he understood it was very important to make precise measurements. He also recognized that certain chemicals and substances have specific characteristics. And finally, that the proper dosage is key. Too much can create a toxin. He was a mystic, a physician. He went through um, many countries in Europe treating the poor. He was a humanitarian 
And in that way, I can also speak to him as someone who is quite enlightened about mental health issues. He rejected the concept of the four humors that was quite medieval, and also the idea that evil spirits were responsible for mental illness. And of course, he was a natural philosopher. So that combination of science and mysticism. This is the Rosicrucian portrait which illustrates a collection of the writings of Paracelsus. And it is very important to understand how, how he figures in the tradition of the Rose Cloth. He insisted on observation and experience over reading classical writers. He also uh, got his name, perhaps again, not from his own accord, but because he exceeded Celsus. So para means to go above and beyond. So Paracelsus meaning to go beyond the writings of Celsus, a first century medical writer depicted in the upper window of the screen. So the traditional Rosicrucian portrait based on the earlier Hirschvogel contains the same phrase in Latin. Let no man belong to another who can belong to himself. The child's head in the other window is a symbol of rebirth in alchemy. The cross is pate in the coat of arms, a reference to the Templars. Note the name of his sword on the pommel, Azoth. Legend states that it contained the elixir of life in a secret chamber. In the Rosicrucian Digest from 2013 on alchemy, you can read an excellent article that details the life and thinking of Paracelsus, written by former Imperator Ralph M. Lewis. So let's speak a little bit about Azoth. This is an image attributed to Basil Valentine from 1659, Azoth of the Philosophers. Around the circle in Latin, I will translate for you, visit the interior of the earth, and by transformation, you will find the hidden stone. Azoth combines English, Greek, and Hebrew. It represents the A to Z in English, the Alpha and Omega in Greek, and the Aleph and Tav of internal transformation sought by the alchemists. It also stands for Mercury, or that mercurial aspect of the vital life force hidden in all living things. In alchemy, Mercury is energy, and you see it there in the upper right of the triangle, spiritus, whereas salt refers to the body or matter at the base of the triangle, the tip of the triangle, corpus. Sulfur to fire, seen as anima in relation to the sun, whereas spiritus is the feminine aspect with the moon. So sulfur is light or the soul. Each of the three aspects of divine mind depicted by the trinity of energy, matter, and light, or spirit as we refer to it in the Rosicrucian teachings, body and soul, spirit being energy. Now I'm going to uh, just interrupt here a little bit by talking to you the dangers of meditating and falling asleep. Brothers and sisters, I hope this doesn't happen to you, either through a very deep and long meditation with lit can candles in your sanctum, or perhaps what happened here to Isaac Newton when his papers caught on fire. Sir Isaac Newton lived during the time of Benjamin Franklin, and Newton was the president of the Royal Society in England. It may be that Ben Franklin could have heard him lecture when he was first in England in his 20s. Newton also meditated on hermetic symbols and wrote a commentary on the Emerald Tablet. You will again read about um, Newton and his commentary, which was translated from Latin into English by Frater Stephen Armstrong, and you can do that in the Rosicrucian Digest, Volume 91, from 2013. I want to again refer to the Rose Claw Journal and particularly the article by Dennis Hauck in the 2014 volume 10 issue. So you can look both at the digest 
and at the Rose Quad Journal, and you can find them online on the Rosicrucian website. Dennis Houck in the Rose Quad Journal explains how alchemists of the past would use both prayer and practical work in their laboratories as forms of meditation, or what they call use of the true imagination, which we call active visualization. They would use images and symbols like the Azoth and the Rose Cross. And I will tell you a little secret here now that the Rose Cross is also a powerful symbol of the Philosopher's Stone. And that brings me to the rubification of the soul. This is an expression that I heard many years ago when I first became a student of the Rosicrucian Order Amorc, and it was used by a frauder, an older member, and it is something that um, I want to talk to you a little bit now. I see someone's lay, raised a hand, so I'm hoping we can come back to you until A16. So save your question for the discussion because I would I'd love to hear it. The Lapidum Philosophorum, or Stone of the Philosophers, is an ancient symbol for enlightenment. So I hope you recall the presentation by Frater Hugh McCaig on cosmic consciousness. The stone of the philosophers takes various forms, an egg-like sphere, a crystal, a liquid. The most blessed stone is depicted as red, the red king of sulfur, whose union with Mercury, the white queen, creates the gold of the alchemists. In spiritual alchemy, which is what we study in the Rosicrucian order, the search for the stone involves our own transformation at the level of the heart, where the rose evolves and blooms. You may now understand rubification in reference to ruby, the color red. So let us now talk about Nicholas Flamel as we get toward the end of the presentation. Along with his wife, Purnell, sometimes spelled a little differently with the extra E after the R, Flamel was a philanthropist and a legendary alchemist. Actually, his legend increased over the centuries, and particularly in the 17th and then the 18th century, much of his reputation grew. In a dream, we understand that Flamel was told he would be given a book of secrets. So this dream prompted him. And according to legend, legend states that on a pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela in Spain, Portugal, he met a sage who gave him the secrets to alchemy and the philosopher's stone. He also, like Paracelsus, traveled Europe widely in search of those who could translate this book. And thus he was purported to have found the elixir of life. So let's look more closely at this image. You will notice the six pointed star, the interlaced triangles. This is a powerful symbol in alchemy that represents the as above, so below. As below, so above. In the center, you will see the symbol for Mercury. You will also notice the snake biting its tail, the Ouroboros, or circle of light, life, the one thing. Through the meditation of one mind, so do all created things originate from this one thing, through transformation. That is the translation that Dennis Houck has made of the Emerald Tablet. So the next question is, what is the elixir of life? If you travel to Paris today, you can still see some engravings on the front of the house belonging to Nicolas Flamel in Paris. And you will see words in Latin like aura. Aura et labora in alchemy literally translates as pray and work, or 
as we say in the order, work and worship. The elixir of life is also referenced or referred to as the quintessence or fifth element. Finding it is the secret to immortality. Purification is part of the process of creating tinctures or elixirs and essences. Inner purification is a key part of this work. Let us explore this secret more deeply and the meaning of the Philosopher's Stone. Perhaps we might find out a little bit more if we looked at some of the works of Nicholas Flamel. And you see here the book of hieroglyphic figures attributed to him, here meaning alchemical symbols, not Egyptian hieroglyphs. You might also notice the red and green dragons, emblems of transformation in alchemy. This particular image is from Michael Mayer's Atlanta Fugians, a much later work, but again, around the time of the Rosicrucian manifestos. You see here the main symbol of the philosopher's stone from Atlanta Fugians, a large circle with a triangle, a square, and another circle. So these geometric figures are clues to understanding the Philosopher's Stone and where you may find it. I would invite you to read Peter Binden's analysis of this particular image, again, in the Rosicrucian Digest, um, volume 91, from 2013. So here is the Nicholas Flamel house. On the left, you will see a much more recent image of what the house looks like. It's a stone house on the outside with wooden doors and glazed windows. In the middle image, you will see what it looked like a few years ago before it was restored. And it was operating as a, a tavern and a restaurant. On the far right, you will see the gravestone of Flamel. And like Benjamin Franklin, Flamel created his own tombstone before his transition. So let us now take a few moments and enter the oldest house in Paris. Let us see what we can discover there. On the outside, before we go in, we will notice a plaque. This plaque was erected by the city of Paris and it commemorates the fact that this is the whole oldest house still standing from 1407 and belonged to Nicolas Flamel and his wife, Renelle. So, frauders and sororers, with your eyes open and just remaining where you are seated comfortably, I want you to take a journey in your imagination to Paris of the past. So stand now in front of the door to the Nicholas Flamel house. And you see that it's lit by a lantern with a bright light. You also see on the side, you might even be able to read that inscription, Aura, O-R-A, referring to worship or pray. Imagine yourself crossing the threshold of the Flamel house. You're using now the active imagination to do this, to go back and project our consciousness in space and time. As you enter, it's becoming a little bit darker and you see a wooden stair. Ascend that stair now to an upper room the inner sanctum and laboratory of Nicholas Flamel. Look about this room. What do you see? Dear frauders and sorors, please now close your eyes with your feet flat on the floor and your hands palms down in your lap 
and take three deep, positive breaths. Feel your consciousness moving back in space and time. Seat yourself at an old wooden table. There are candles lit on this table. And in front of you lies an old book. Turn the pages of this old book. Perhaps you see words written there or an image. As you contemplate the book, Ask yourself, what is this philosopher's stone that I am seeking? Know that those who find it find the answers to all of life's questions. Who is the knight of the golden stone of the chemical wedding? What are her or his responsibilities? If you have a question, ask it now of your master within. You hear a voice say, Seek ye the stone, it is hidden within. So mote it be. So thank you, Frauders and Sorors, for participating in this little trip back into the past. So I would invite you now to think about what Frater Christian Bernard has written about the phrase via rose qua. The question was asked, what does it mean? To be a Rosicrucian means to be on the path to enlightenment. To be a rose qua signifies having come to the end of that path. Our inner self knows and understands this finality. To know and to understand is like being there already. 
Therefore, be a rose qua also means let us behave as though we had arrived. It is a very great responsibility and challenge. For if as Rosicrucians we may stumble and even fall, make fundamental errors and yet proceed, as Rose Qua we cannot do so. To be a Rose Qua is to be an example. It is also to be a light so powerful that it dispels darkness. A Rose Qua is initially a Rosicrucian but one whose qualities are exceptionally developed. And I would add, frauders and sorors, who can make that claim? I certainly cannot. I want to add one more thing here before we finish and say our goodbyes, that by definition, the rose qua, as Frater Bernard writes, must possess all the virtues, but to him, eight of them seem the most essential and I'm going to list them for you. They are obedience, confidence, patience, humility, simplicity, tolerance, strength, and love. He says the rose qua is therefore obedient, meaning obedient to the voice of the master within. Confident, patient, humble, simple, tolerant, strong, and loving. He says, of course, these are innumerable virtues, but those are the main eight according to his mind. So I just want to say um, next time you will hear again from Dr. Hugh McCaig, who is going to be talking about the concept of the temple. And then in the next Wednesday, I will come back with part two of Who Are the Rose Qua about Harvey Spencer Lewis and his early life and trip to France. And now, frauders and sorors, it's time to say farewell, and I bid you peace profound. Thank you again all for being here. And health, peace wisdom, profound. strength, peace, peace profound. profound. <laughs>